it's all right. I talk really loud, and so when I talk into a microphone, people are like, step, step back, step back. And I'm like, what? You want me to do what? I'm going to take off my sunglasses because I can't read without these ones on. Hi, everybody. My name is Mo Santiago. Um, I am a poet and photographer. I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Um, like, I'm from Chicago. You know how some people are like, I'm from Chicago, you know, where Evanston and Schomburg are. And I'm like, stop that. Yeah, um, I, I would call myself an intimate artist. Uh, I write about sexuality, abortion, assault, being a survivor. Um, and I study those themes, the relationship with, with the self. There's nothing I love more. There's nothing I find more intimate than the love and care of and for one's body and oneself. So I study that in my writing and in my photography. Um, and so I brought with me today the only living copy of my book. I wish people would stop asking me when it's going to come out. I'm like, I don't know, here's one copy. So I'm going to read. I don't know what I was going to read up until I heard Emma start reading, which absolutely beautiful, by the way. Um, some of my favorite pieces that, that, that I've written. Uh, so I want to read Dead Girl, that looks like me first. All right. I'm glad I numbered all the pages. I didn't know who I thought was going to be reading this, but I numbered them all just in case someone was like, OK, this poem is on this page. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Dead girl, that looks like me. <clears throat> Somewhere out there, a young woman with brown curls is lying in a ditch. It has been three days since anyone has noticed this body. She was wearing a ponytail when she was taken, a smile before she turned around, a forest coat and brown boots. She might have had a similar sounding name, something about the vowels. On a Tuesday, she is discovered and she is taped and pardoned from the freeway. She no longer hangs in limbo. She may just gawk at her own decay, watch as a man with very similar hands to the last turn her over and move her. She does not look at him. She did not look at the last one. She didn't want to know. When they put her in a bag, face up, more courtesy than he had, she is grateful to feel like her eyes are closed. She's grateful to have been found. When they cannot contact her family because he pulled out all of her teeth, stole away her fingerprints, devoided her of identity, she learns the word lost. When she is sitting in a metal box for six weeks with no reprieve, they bury her in a local cemetery and they bury her unnamed white female in November 1980. This is how they make us forgotten. They are thorough in their work. They are faithful to their cause. This is how they take our names. This is how they take our lives. This is how they take us out. It's a group effort. Um, so that's the kind of artist I am. I like to be in people's faces. So my entire book is called I Could Be a Body and Other Delusions and it studies my uh, experience as a two-time survivor of assault. I had an abortion going through that. Um, and it also studies uh, the unnamed white females actually from an article I read about someone that they found um, who was described to look just like me same details, and they found her in a ditch on the side of the road, and they buried her like that. And so my book uh, honors all of those people, and I think it's my duty to make people uncomfortable while I'm alive, um, because I'm also a spoken word teaching artist. I teach middle schoolers, and if a 12-year-old can understand that we need to be having more uncomfortable conversations, I think a bunch of adults can too. So uh, that was that poem. <laughs> um, I also understand if someone's like, I'm having some of my own trauma feelings and anxiety, so if you need to get up and take a moment, that's okay. Your feelings are about you, my feelings are about me, I understand you. Um, let's see. I will read a less depressing poem. Okay, I'm going to read this one because it's really fun, and I wrote it, and the last time I performed it, um, I think was the only time I'd ever gotten to perform it. So, this one's called Chivalry is Dead. Chivalry is dead. Obviously, women don't let men pick them up in their cars anymore. We could die in there. You think I want to take the bus? No. But you think I trust Jeffrey to get me there? Absolutely fucking not. People with his name have a history of eating people, okay? They should stop calling them trunks and rebrand as coffins already, but then Ford would really start to lose money on the escape, something I don't have a high statistic of doing successfully. I mean, no one wants to participate in murder capitalist America, but time is money, so they'll sell the cars anyway, tell you how nice it fits in the driveway, how much room you got in the trunk. I don't know, how many square inches does a body take up? Oh. Oh. 
<laughs> Salty is single-handedly giving me life. <laughs> I understand what kind of poet I am. I understand what kind of person I am. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Um, I'm gonna read. How many more poems? Can I read like two more? Is that okay? How do how do we feel? Audience check in. Okay, okay. okay. Time is not real. Time is actually a complete social construct, and I talk about that with my students a lot. We read this poem that's in here called the Amanahe that studies um, time, like when the poem was written and then when I was assaulted. And I explain to them about like my relationship with time, and it's really interesting how 12-year-olds like grab them at that like young mindset where they're like, I'm running behind on things. And I'm like, just kidding, this adult doesn't care about anything. And I'm like, <laughs> Be late. Stop and smell the roses. Have a cup. There's always time for a cup of coffee. Well, so I was watching a show last night, and this bounty hunter was chasing down this fugitive who turned out to be innocent. Um, and she had like cuffed him to to the bar, and he's like, "Let's have a drink." And she goes, "No, no, no. You're my bounty." And he goes, but "There's always time for a drink." And I'm like, "I like this guy's mindset." He's getting arrested, but he's like, so time for a drink. I'm like, him. Okay, uh, so I'm going to read the closing poem of this book. Oh, I'm lying. That's totally not the closing poem. The second to last closing poem. No, I, I will read the closing poem. Uh, it's called I Would Like to Leave a Voicemail, which is part of a series of voicemails. Um, my, I was in London the second time I was assaulted, and so I went to this place called uh, The Haven, which is like their Planned Parenthood but better because it's free for everybody, even if you're not from that country. Um, absolutely really beautiful, but I went, and it was the only time I'd ever got a kit done, and this woman, Rashida, like called me for two years straight, and I never answered. Um, so this is the very last poem in a series of them. It's called, I Would Like to Leave a Voicemail. <clears throat> Hi, Rashida. It's Mo. I wanted to ask you to destroy my samples, if you haven't already. That's easier to type than it will be to say, which is why this isn't real, I guess. I'm sorry. I never answered any of your phone calls. I knew it was you. I was scared. I still am. I just didn't know how to be the girl who didn't report, especially because I had the power to do so. It's not nice having power like that, especially when you're scared. You can't always muster up that kind of courage, you know? People don't like people with power. And I don't even like the police in my country, let alone in another's. And it was the second time. I didn't know how to be the girl who got assaulted again. I was really scared then. I just wanted it to be over to move on with my life. But you kept calling and I kept not answering. You called over the year mark. Why? Why did you do that? Keep my samples for so long. And why do you call them samples? Why not swabs? Why not DNA? Why keep evidence for so long and keep calling and keep on with me? Was there something else that I should have known? Um, I will read this last one, which is completely different from anything in here. So I am a white Latina. My mother is Irish. My father is Puerto Rican. I don't speak any Spanish, so I'm a bad Hispanic. Um, and I wrote a lot of poems about that middle ground where white people are like, you're not white, haha. -ha. And then Hispanic people are like, you're not a Latina. And I'm like, awesome. Uh, but uh, my mother enrolled me in Catholic school. I came from a poor family. I don't know why. I don't know how we afforded ca Catholic school for a single year, but I went to Catholic school and it was horrible. So this poem is called, Yeah, I went to Catholic school. You see, when I was a kid, my mother enrolled me in Catholic school on the other side of the neighborhood, which didn't make any sense because my mother wasn't religious, but she wore a gold cross and she told me that, that was her chain and my mother never took off her chain. Anyway, I let it go and I went to Catholic school. And I don't know if I've ever hated anything more in my entire life. Between my hairdos and my eyebrows, I stuck out. My mother thumbed me into a pickle, and every kid in the class seemed to know something I didn't. Always winded with the whispers, but raised the wall of the dead when it came to me. I wondered if any of those white kids even knew a dead person, and if they knew about the Day of the Dead, because there's a lot more to it than just talk. And they would know that if they weren't white. On Halloween, my mother made me late for Catholic school, which is, in hindsight, actually might have been my fault, but whatever. I don't remember it that way, and when I finally made it to snack time, none of the girls would make room for me. Their mom spent their Catholic money on expensive costumes, and mine was from Walmart, which was fine because I liked Walmart. But Snow White made way between Batman and Batboy, which, let's be honest, seems really redundant. Anyway, that didn't matter because I was purposely dropping carrots on the floor so I could cry. A little, but not in front of the boys because they would think I was sillier than I felt that I looked. After that, I decided to be angry. One day, this white kid, Kevin, whose mom was super Catholic and whose dad was also super Catholic, but not on Saturday nights, 
but he had Sundays to repent, so it didn't really matter. Anyway, Kevin told me I couldn't be Catholic, so I pushed him off of the uh, playhouse. Not that I wanted to be Catholic, I was just mad he said there was something I couldn't be in Catholic school. When my teacher took us to the chapel for a visit, I told her I didn't like the way I felt inside the walls. And she told me to get over it. But that just made me really, really mad. So instead of getting over it, I cussed in the chapel and she made me sit down and told me I couldn't finish the rest of the chapel visit and that I was going to get an F and then I had to explain to my mother that it was just a visit and why should I be graded for not liking something and for feeling uncomfortable and I think that's where some of my trauma stems from, but that didn't even matter right now. I didn't even know if my teacher was a real nun or not, so why did it matter? And even if she wasn't a nun, could she still be my teacher because it wasn't Sunday school and I was pretty sure nuns only taught on Sundays. I knew that because my mother took me to Sunday school when I was in Camp Iwana and I went, but I didn't really want to go, so eventually I stopped going. One day, my mother transferred me to public school. I wasn't exactly sure why, but I think it was because of the pushing and the cussing. Um, or maybe it was because of the unaffordability or, that raged on my side of the neighborhood and my mother thought Catholic school would have been better but not good enough at cost. But anyway, one day my great granny Annie, who was my grandpa's mom, who was religious but my grandpa was not and my mother was not, my grandma might have been a little religious so they asked her to take me and my great granny Annie to the church on Sundays. I didn't like the wines and I didn't like the crackers salted and all the pews but I still, and I still didn't feel like the way I felt inside the walls. And that's when I saw Kevin, you remember Kevin? You know the kid I pushed? I saw him and he volunteered to carry the basket around but I didn't have any money so he just gave me this dirty look. And I should have told Kevin that people at public school like me, which would have been a lie because even though I had hairdos and they had hairdos and our eyebrows were the same kind of thick and our skin was the same kind of dark, even though we were the same kind of Spanish, none of the kids were white. It didn't matter because they still didn't like me at public school. But Kevin didn't need to know that. But I should have told him, and I should have told him that the dead didn't care much for his walls, and I should have told him that I wasn't going to put him up on the ofrenda, even though I didn't know what that was. But I was hoping that if I didn't, that I would just forget that I ever went to Catholic school in the first place. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go sit down and drink some water because I get nervous speaking in front of people. Um, and now it's time for the amazing coffee. Okay.